الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ومن ولا أما بعد still speaking about the قرن الذهبي the golden ever or the golden generation of the compilation of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام and continuing our discussion on the Sihah genre the books which were called Sihah, Sahih's. Um, and <clears throat> the next book that comes after the Sahih or the Jami' as we've explained in detail of Imam al-Bukhari was the monumental work of Imam Muslim Ibn al-Hajjaj rahimahullahu ta'ala. And the specific title that Imam Muslim rahimahullah gave his book uh, was not Sahih Muslim. Very similar to the book of Al-Bukhari. He never called his book Sahih Al-Bukhari. Uh, the common uh, household name or common generic name among uh, the Muslims today. Whether they're people of knowledge or laymen and women. The actual name that Imam Muslim rahimahullah, gave his book was called Al-Musnad Al-Sahih Al-Mukhtasar. Min al-Sunani bi naql al-Adli an al-Adli an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or, in a shorter version, he called it Al-Musnad As-Sahih. Imam Muslim, he called his book Al-Musnad As-Sahih. In several lessons, we've explained the term Musnad. What is meant by the word Musnad? Okay, whether it is an actual book, a Musnad, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, or whether it is a specific type of Hadith. We've explained that in our lessons on al baykhuniyyah We've also explained what the word Musnad means in the earlier lessons on the compilation of the Sunnah. When we were speaking about most of the Musnads were put together in the Qarna uh, Dhahabi, the golden generation of the golden era of the 3rd century, specifically the first half of the 3rd century. So Imam Muslim, he called his book Musnad. And the reason why he called it a Musnad, not because it was organized according to the companions and their names. However, he called it a Musnad. Because all of the hadith that he wanted to mention were musnadah. They had continuous chains. They had chains of narrations that weren't broken. They weren't severed or separated. Everything that he quoted in his book, he supported it with a hadith, with a isnad that could be traced back to the Messenger of Allah. And it's called al musnad al sahih. In other words, the original uh, objective of Imam Muslim was to place in his book. A hadith which he believed to be authentic. Okay? Some of those ahadith, many of them, if not most of them, were ahadith in which most of the ulama or at least or all of the ulama had agreed upon were sahih, were authentic. Many of them were of this class. Some of those ahadith were ahadith in which his teachers and some of his specific instructors agreed with him, with their pupil Muslim, and said, these are sahih hadith, put them in your book. And some of the hadith that Imam Muslim put in his book, were hadith in which there may have been a different view. There may have been one or two different views on whether the hadith was authentic or not, but Imam Muslim, he was a mujtahid, he was an independent scholar himself, okay, he had studied the science of al-ilal, and the science of al-jarh wa ta'adil, and the different sciences that pertain to declaring the hadith to be authentic, and he declared them to be sahih, and he put them in his book. So therefore, Imam Muslim rahimahullah, and we cannot go too far down the rabbit's hole in this beginning class. However, Imam Muslim rahimahullah, and we quote, we said his original purpose, or the original class or set of hadith in his book, are those are hadith that he rahimahullah ta'ala believed and professed to be authentic from the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. Khayr inshallah, moving on. Uh, from the most distinguishing marks, or special features of Imam Muslim's book. And uh, before we move on, يعني, this topic here of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, their status, their importance, their virtue, their ahadith, those ahadith are authentic. Um, this is a very, very important uh, discussion that Bidna Azawajal will have to be given in a separate lecture series. A separate lecture series. Wallahi, we could speak on this just on Bukhari's book and him and himself and his work and his legacy for 10 classes, 10 lectures. 
and similarly that of Imam Muslim. So this is bikhtisar, yani. this is in brief and summary because the books of Bukhari Muslim, they are not our main topic of discussion. Rather we're talking about the accomplishment of the Sunnah as a whole. As a whole. So bidna azza wa we want to um, hopefully publish some of the uh, lectures on the actual biographies of Bukhari and Muslim. Just talking about their lives and how they lived and how they died and what they stood for. Therefore, from the most uh, distinguishing marks or special features of the book of Ibn Muslim was his beautiful style of arranging and organizing the ahadith in his book. He put them all in one place in contrast to Al-Bukhari who would take one hadith and separate it and put it in seven different chapters. And in different chapters with different wordings. And in different chapters with complete or short summarized versions. Okay? He would, as we explained before, he would dissect the hadith. He would slice up the hadith. He would take it and put a piece there, a piece here, a piece here. Because each piece of the hadith represented a different legal issue. Or different benefit in tafsir. Or different benefit with regards to creed. And so on and so forth. As for Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, then he took that one hadith and he brought all of the versions that he wished to collect and all of the different uh, chains and roots of transmission that he believed to be authentic or wanted to show there was something wrong with them or whatever the case may be. And he put them in one place. He put them in one place. So therefore, let's take a brief simple example of this. Okay, the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam that was narrated by Umar ibn Khattab. I spoke about the pillars of Islam and Iman and Ihsan and the last day and its signs. Iman Muslim, he puts this book where? In the book of Iman. The book of Iman. The first chapter after the introduction. And that's, all, that's the only place you're going to find a hadith. And it's not, he doesn't mention it in any other place. As for Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, then he may take, for example, the hadith of Jibreel, which is narrated by Abu Hurairah, because the hadith of Umar is not in Bukhari, it's only in Muslim. And he may put that hadith in zakat and salat and iman in this book and that place and this place. In other words, from that hadith of Jibreel, we take benefits of zakat, benefits of salah, benefits of iman, benefits of ihsan, benefits of the last day, so on and so on and so forth. But Imam Muslim puts it in one place. Okay, he puts one hadith and the, the chapter in which he feels is most appropriate and most general and most comprehensive. Clear, inshallah. Um, also, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, as we said before, he never put the sub-chapter headings in his book. He never put the sub-chapter headings or the sub-chapter titles. He only put the actual chapter headings, the kutub, kitabul iman, the book of purification, the book of salah, the book of minces, the book of this, the book of that. That's the only thing he put in his book. Some scholars came after him and they put the abwab. Bab, the subchapter, increase and decrease in every man. The one who does this, kada. The salah is obligatory, kada. The virtue of doing kada. You understand? Imam Muslim didn't put that in his book. And that's because he didn't intend for his book to be like that. Rather, he named it a musnad sahih. A hadith that has a general categorization with authentic chains of narration and the mutun are authentic. Clear, inshallah. Moving on. Um, another... A uh, distinguishing feature of his book is that he made an introduction to his book. And this is in contrast to, uh, to Al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari never made a muqaddimah. He never made an introduction. In a Muslim, he made an introduction to his book, speaking about the importance of the sunnah, the importance of hadith and its sciences, the importance of ilm al ruat knowing the men and the reporters, the, the, the importance of avoiding the hadith which is munkar, the hadith which is munkar rejected and disavowed. Okay? He spoke about all of these different things here. Uh, he spoke about the importance and the obligation of narrating from the trustworthy, pious men. The pious narrators of the sunnah and not narrating from the people of innovations. Okay? He spoke about uh, many other issues that pertain to the sciences of hadith in his introduction. Al-Isnad al-Mu'an'an. The narration which is Mu'an'an. And to stop just a little, hopefully those who listen to the Bayquaniya lessons can now appreciate and understand some of those terms and what they mean. Because we took in the Bayquaniya lessons, Ka'an Sa'idin An Karam. What is a Mu'an'an narration? And Imam Muslim in his book, he talks about the Mu'an'an narration. So, therefore, if a person wants to benefit from the introduction of Sahih Muslim, how does he, if he doesn't understand, Al Mustalah? 
hadith terminology. So this all plays together. It's all in sync. One thing that you learn here will help you there. A piece that you learn over there, you can bring it back to your original learning until you complete your knowledge. You have a full circle of ilm. You have a thorough understanding. You understand the terms. You understand the proofs and evidences, the difference of opinion, the narrators, the dates, the books. Wahakitha. Until you become a complete student of knowledge and a hadith disciple. Bidinah Azza wa Jal. And after Imam Muslim made the introduction, the only thing that he put in his book was a hadith. Very seldom does Imam Muslim quote an athar. Okay, something which is maqtur or monquf from the Sahaba or from the Tabi'een. And we also explained that in Al-Bayhuniya. Imam Muslim, from the distinguishing uh, features of his book, is that he plays very, very, very close attention to the wordings of transmission, let alone the wordings of hadith. In other words, this one sheikh said, Akhbarana, and another sheikh said, Hadathana. He reported to us, and he says, no, he narrated to us. He, I read in his book, he, يعني, the different سيغو tahammul. The different ways and styles and techniques of taking from your teacher. Your teacher could read to you from his book. He could read hadith to you. He could dictate to you. Or he could just read to you. It all depends. Your teacher could tell you from his memory. You could read your teacher's notes to him. And all of these different terms have different meanings. They have different levels. They have a different status. They're not all agreed upon. They are not all given one level of preference and so on and so forth. As we said before, the science of hadith is a very technical science. Very critical science. Very precise, sharp, pointed science. And nothing about the science of hadith is dull. Nothing. It's very sharp. So therefore, the scholars of hadith were very critical. They were so critical that many others who do not specialize in their great tradition and culture may call them petty and excessive. And you look too deep into everything and so on and so forth. But according to the muhadithin, the traditionists, the scholars of hadith... This was the sunnah they were dealing with. This was the legacy of Islam. This was Muhammad's way. This was the explanation of the Quran. This was the creed. This was the deen. So it had to be critical and it had to preserve everything. Anything that wasn't from the sunnah, they kicked it out and they banished it. It doesn't belong here. And anything that was originally from the sunnah, they kept it inside of the gates and the walls. And they said, it can't leave. This is what Muhammad said. This is what Muhammad did. This is what Muhammad allowed. This is what Muhammad looked like. This is what the companions said and understood and so on and so forth. So the concept of being critical and of being precise is like the bread and the butter to the scholars of hadith. Bread and butter. It's nothing extra. It's nothing that is, oh, if I... F-. No, that is the critical guiding principle of the science of hadith was diqqa. It's diqqa. It's to be sharp. Always to be sharp. And never to be laxed. So therefore, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, this is from the distinguishing marks of his book. There are other scholars in different times and different issues in which they may have reported the hadith bil ma'na in the meaning and not necessarily verbatim. Or the different seal, the different ways of transmission, they may have <clears throat> yani, mentioned it all in one as general. It's, it's similar meaning, la ba's. However, Muslim wasn't like this. So therefore, this is one of the distinguishing features between Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And this is one of the reasons why the wordings, the al the wordings of hadith that are found in Sahih Muslim are more accurate than the wordings that are found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Muslim very seldom narrates hadith bil ma'na by meaning. Paraphrases the hadith. No. He quotes verbatim. Al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he wasn't home when he wrote his book. He wasn't always in his hometown when he wrote his book. Rather, he wasn't always stable in one place. He wrote his book while traveling. As Imam al-Bukhari would say sometimes, he says, maybe a hadith that I heard in Sham from one of my scholars, I wrote it down in Yemen. He says, a hadith I heard in Baghdad, I may have written and recorded down in, in Hijaz. Allahu Akbar. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine that? A hadith that he heard in Syria. Maybe he didn't write it down until he got to Mesopotamia in Iraq. A hadith that he heard in Hijaz in Arabia, he didn't hear until he was in Yemen or in, in, in Bukhara or Samarkand or this place and that place. Could you imagine that? The strength of his memory, the power of his, of his memory. That was Al-Bukhari. As for Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, then he took several years, over 10 years, writing his book. Over 10 years compiling his book. And he wrote his book, in most cases, in Nishapur. He was in Nisabur. He was in his hometown. Many of his teachers were alive. He could refer back to his notes, and he could give the precise wording. So these are from the distinguishing features between Bukhari and Muslim. Okay? 
um, as uh, from the distinguishing features of Bukhari and Muslim also, is that in general, Al-Bukhari's book is more authentic. In general, we said that the book of Al-Bukhari is more authentic, it's cleaner book. It's, it's it, the, the authenticity, the level of genuineness of those narrations, and the men, and the reporters, and also the women too, is stronger. It's far stronger, far stronger. Okay, so every book has a special virtue, has a special unique quality to it. These are some of the distinguishing factors between Bukhari and Muslim. Al-Bukhari was far harsher, far harsher when it came to reporters and narrators and anything that was said about a hadith or critique from the hadith. He was harder than he went the Muslim. And this shows the human nature, that some people are stronger in this and stronger than that. Harsher in this, softer in that, and so on and so forth. So on and so forth. Uh, for this reason, and we don't want to spend too much time on this, some scholars say that when a student of knowledge wants to learn hadith and its science from a bigger, more mature book, and I'm talking about a beginner, then he should study Sahih Muslim first. And he should not study Sahih al-Bukhari first. As for the student of knowledge who wants a stronger, more mature way of learning fiqh, and especially the fiqh of the salaf, the fiqh of the righteous predecessors, because there's a world of difference between the fiqh of the four main schools, between comparative fiqh, between the fiqh of this teacher and this fatwa, and the fiqh of the salaf. The fiqh of the salaf is different. Okay? It's a richer fiqh. But we're not going to get into that right now. And when we say that a person should follow the salaf, and his understanding, and his practice of the deen, it doesn't just pertain to aqidah. As many people, many ignorant people try to make it seem that it's ours. You just, you, I, I try to follow the way of the salaf, I try to adhere to the way of the salaf, just in my creed. And just when it comes to innovations, la! You follow the salaf and their fiqh. You understand what they understood in their ibadah, and their piety, and their righteousness, and also their precision, as we mentioned. In any aspect of the religion, you try to take the example of the understanding of the companions and of the tabi'een. In every aspect of the deen. However, most people today, whenever they hear the word manhaj as-salaf or madhab as-salaf or ahl sunnah wal jama'ah or ahl al-hadith, whatever term is used, the only thing that they think of and that they talk about is aqidah or some people say quote-unquote manhaj or innovations and people of innovation. That's all they think about. And that is a... That is, that is, a horrible mistake. This is a terrible mistake. And I'm not speaking about one specific person. I'm anybody who who the shoe fits. A sheikh, a quote unquote scholar, a student of knowledge, an imam, whoever they are. Those people that have disrespected the way of the salaf. And they have restricted it just to one avenue or two avenues of the deen. There's disrespect to the companions and to the tabi'een. Rather, people, they have to Understand the deen as they understood it in every aspect of the religion. In every aspect of the religion. Um, so therefore, they say that if a person wants to understand fiqh salaf and have a strong understanding of fiqh and a more mature study and approach of fiqh, then he should start off with al-Bukhari. Not saying that al-Bukhari's book is not a book of hadith. Of course, it's a major book of hadith. But we're talking about the main style. Okay? So therefore, when we talk about the different Mutabi'ayats in the Shawahid, supporting narrations and other versions, you're going to find all of that in one place in the book of Imam Muslim. And you'll understand the different terms and the different ways of taqreej better in Sahih Muslim than you will in Bukhari. And if you want to take fiqh and istinbat, deducement and extraction of meanings and so on and so forth, then the book of Bukhari is considered to be a gold mine. Khairan, inshallah. Moving on. Um... <clears throat> There are several different explanations of Sahih Muslim, uh, not as many as Al-Bukhari. However, there are many explanations, from the most famous of them is the work of An-Nawi Rahimahullah, Imam Nawi Daniel 676, as we all know. He wrote a very famous book, which is called Al-Minhaj, Sharh Sahih Muslim, Ibn Al-Hajjaj. Al-Minhaj, and the book has been edited from its manuscript, and it's in uh, widespread circulation and has several different prints. And there are many other explanations of Sahih Muslim. Allah Azawajal Alam. Now, the next topic of discussion, after we briefly, and I quote, after we've only briefly discussed the whole concept of what a Sahih is, and its genre, and its movement, and that is because there are many, many other books that are called Sahih. Some of those Sahih books were written um, Later on, after the golden era, 
some in the 4th century, okay, some a little later on, and some of them maybe even earlier. However, those were the two main books that were put together and authored in the actual time period called the Golden Era. But a Muslim is not to understand, the student of knowledge shouldn't think that Bukhari and Muslim are the only Sahih books. No, that's not true. There are many other books that are called Sahih, whether they have that exact title or not. But there are books in which the author considered the Hadith to be what? Authentic. Or most of the Hadith in the book authentic or the main or written like the front line. The front line of a Hadith to be the Then he may bring a second line and a third line which may not be as authentic or may not be authentic at all. But the first line of defense he considers they are all top notch. Okay? There are many other books that have this classification besides the books of Al-Bukhari Muslim. However, for obvious reasons, some of them will be mentioned, Al-Bukhari and Muslim, their books became mainstream famous for who they were and much more than just who they were because they were great scholars of hadith. But we said because what? The generation, the era in which they lived, that golden era. Khair inshallah. Moving on. Um, from the most important books after the Sahih genre and after the Musnad genre and the Jami' genre, uh, and many of those books that were put together in the 3rd century is that which we call As-Sunan. We call As-Sunan. Kutub As-Sunan. The books of As-Sunan. Okay? And the main topic of a book which is called As-Sunan is to compile and to collect those hadith that speak about the various legal issues. The issues of fiqh, of Islamic jurisprudence. The issues of the halal and the haram. The issues of what you can and cannot do. What water is permissible to use for wudu. What water is impermissible to be used for wudu. How to make ghusl. How to pray. How to fast. How to make hajj. What is jihad. When is it jihad. When, is it, when isn't it jihad. What is the virtue of jihad. Marriage. Divorce. Child custody. Breastfeeding. All of these different issues. Emancipation of slaves. And so on and so forth. These are all issues that are the main topics of a book which is called Sunan. Sunan. Okay? So there's a new type of class now. It's not Sahih. It's not a Jami'ah. It's not a Musnad. It's not a compilation of notes, a compendium, memorandums, as we mentioned. The different notes and letters in the early first generation. Nah, this is an actual book that the author puts together and he calls it Sunan. Everybody understand this? So that is the main topic of the sunan. The hadith that talk about what? Fiqh. Whether it's acts of worship or whether it is uh, transactions, buying and selling, marriage and divorce, writing a will, inheritance. Okay? Clear inshallah. And then, uh, let's talk more about this sunan, quote unquote. A sunan book is a book in which the author does not at all deem and declare all of the narrations in his work to be genuine. So therefore, this is the first distinctive point or contrast, point of contrast between the Sahih work and between the Sunan work. Everybody got this? They're different. A Sunan, the author doesn't say everything is genuine. I'm not claiming that. I never did. I'm giving you the most famous ahadith, the most authentic ahadith. Okay, not, not necessarily authentic, but the most authentic. Is this the best hadith about this issue? And I put it in my book and I organize it and I arrange it. From purification to salat to janazah, huh? book of funerals to zakat to sadaqah, fasting, hajj, buying and selling, loaning people money, taking debts, investing in business, marriage, divorce, so on and so forth, child custody, to the end of the chapters of Islamic fiqh. That is a book of Sunan. Everybody clear? Khairan, inshallah. In most cases, the Sunan, if not in all cases, but to be safe, in most cases, the author of a Sunan book is going to bring a chapter and he himself is going to write the chapter heading. And the purpose of the chapter heading is to show the student the main lesson to be taken from the hadith. Or the main point of the hadith. Or to show the reader of the book, a faqih, an alim, whoever is reading his book, this is the main thing to look out from this hadith. 
Not saying that's the only thing you can take from the hadith, but this is the main point. Everybody understand this? This is the main work of a sunan hadith. Or a sunan book. So in other words, hadith, method of <clears throat> the Prophet والسلام, wiping over his socks, his leather socks, his khuthain. In most cases, where are we going to find this hadith? The hadith of Jirir, radiallahu an, or the hadith of Ali, radiallahu an, or the hadith of Mughir ibn Shubar, radiallahu anhu, or yani, Safwan ibn Asal. Where are we going to find these hadith? In most cases, we're going to find them where? In a book of purification, and not in the book of Salat. Even though you could talk about them in Salat too, because the Prophet may have, even, let's say the Prophet prayed in his leather socks. For example, a person could put the hadith in the chapter of buying and selling. The permissibility of buying and selling leather socks. A person can put that hadith in the chapter of slaughtering animals. The permissibility of slaughtering a cow and using its skin for hide, to tan it and to make it into leather. But that's not the main topic. The main benefit is the permissibility of wiping over the sock. And once a person has already washed his feet, he can now, what? Wipe over the leather sock. So that book will be put, or that hadith will be put in the book of purification, at tahara and he will make the chapter Bab al Mas'ar al Khufain, the chapter of wiping over the leather socks. And the Hadith scholars were so skilled and so precise that sometimes they spoke in codes. Sometimes they didn't always have to dumbify and yani, dumb down what they said. The people they were speaking to were knowledgeable men, knowledgeable women. And they knew what the chapter had in meant. The chapter of wiping over the leather socks, yani, in other words, the permissibility of wiping over the leather socks. In other words, the recommendation of wiping over the leather socks. In other words, so on and so on and so forth. The manner of wiping over the leather socks. Okay, and we don't want to go too far off the subject, but this is one of the main mistakes that people who call and claim themselves to be quote-unquote fuqaha, where people of fiqh and masters of fiqh speak, in disregard, speak ill of and disregard the people of hadith. And they say the people of hadith don't have fiqh. They don't have understanding. You can't learn fiqh from books of hadith. You must study books of fiqh. You must, you must. They're ignorant. They're ignorant. Just because Ibn Majah, or Abu Dawood, or Tirmidhi, or Nasai didn't specifically state every single intricate detail in his chapter heading, does not mean that he doesn't understand it. Does not mean that he doesn't know and he hasn't perfected that skill. It doesn't mean that. But the book of hadith is compressed. It's not meant to be a long two paragraphs on one topic. Rather, if you have to explain something in two paragraphs on one topic, that in itself shows a lack of intelligence. Without a doubt. That shows a lack of intelligence. That a person, he can't get your point until you give him a lecture on it. But the smart, sharp, witty person, two or three sentences, one sentence, and he has it. Clear. This is how you extract from the hadith. This is how you deduce from the hadith. Boom, boom, boom. Khalas. Yakfi. So the scholars of hadith and the ulama of hadith without a doubt, they had the greater level of intelligence and of knowledge and understanding. But that's a different topic in itself. Moving on. So therefore, um, this is the main concept of a what? Of a book which is called Sunan. And from what we've taken already, we can see the difference. If we ask you, what is the difference? Make a comparison or a chart between the differences between a Musnad, a Sunan, and a Sahih. The first thing we'll say that a Musnad, how is a Musnad organized? It's organized according to the Sahaba's name. How is a Sahih organized? According to the chapter heading. How is a Sunan organized? According to the chapter heading, the chapter also. But the difference between a Sahih and a Sunan is a Sunan is not always necessarily 100% what? Genuine. Wahakada. Wahakada. Tayyip. From the most important books of Sunan, and from the most famous books of a sunan are that which we call a sunanul arba'a or some people may say a sunanul arba'a it all depends on whether you take the word sunan to be mudhakkar or mu'annath okay lakin a sunanul arba'a al uh from these books is the work of the great scholar of sijistan suleiman Ibn al-Ash'ath who was known as Abu Dawood Rahimahullah Imam Abu Dawood who died in the year 275 of the Hijrah and he was from the great students of Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal Rahimahullah then we have the work of Abu Isa Muhammad Ibn Isa who died in the year 279 of the Hijrah 
Yani At-Tirmidhi, the great scholar of Hadith, the Imam at Imam tirmidhi 279, he died. Even though his book, the most proper title of his book is called Al-Jami'ah. However, it's put among the Sunan for several reasons. But some specialists say that the proper terminology to, to be used is Jami'ah and not Sunan. Labas. Labas. Khayran, inshallah. Moving on. After at tirmidhis Sunan or his Jami'ah is the famous book of Abu Abdurrahman, Ahmad ibn Shu'ib, Al-Khurasani, the great scholar of Khurasan, the great scholar from the lands of Persia, was Al-Nasai, Rahimahullah, Imam Al-Nasai, who died in the year 303 of the Hijrah. So we see Al-Nasai's death was a little later on than Abu Dawood 275 and the Tirmidhi 279. He came a little later on, and technically he died after the golden century or the golden era. So technically he's not a part of that era, but he is. Because it's 303, it's at the beginning, just a few years, and he lived and wrote his book during the actual golden era and studied with many other men from the golden era. Then uh, the fourth place uh, is taken by the great scholar of Qizween, who's also a Persian, Abu Abdullah, Muhammad Ibn Yazid al Qizwini who's commonly referred to as Ibn Majah. Imam Ibn Majah. And... Tayyip. Imam Ibn Majah, rahimahullah, uh, surprisingly, he died the earliest from among all of them. He died 273. 273 years of the Hijrah. Uh, and before I forget, Imam al rahimahullah, we know, from the greatest of his scholars was Al-Bukhari. And perhaps At-Tirmidhi was the greatest pupils of Al-Bukhari. A Muslim was his pupil also. Uh, but when you look at the service of the legacy of the teacher, and quoting from him and benefiting from him, there's no doubt At-Tirmidhi surpassed Muslim as far as being a pupil of Bukhari. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Khayr inshallah. The reason why Ibn Majah was put last, even though he died the earliest from among them, is because his book, uh, from among those four books, is relatively the less authentic, the least authentic. Yani, his book has the most weak hadith, has the most extremely weak hadith, and has the most fabricated hadith from among the four books of Sunan. Yes, the books of Sunan have hadith in there which are considered to be mawdu'a, fabricated. And we haven't yet covered that in Al-Bayquni, but that will, that will come, bi Azza wa Jalla. Also, Al uh, Ibn Majah's book wasn't always necessarily regarded to be among the four books of Sunan or the Qutb al Sitta, the six mother books of Hadith. And that in itself is a long discussion. Who was the first person to mention Qutb al Sitta and why and so on and so forth? Rather, some of the scholars of the past they considered the six books of Hadith to be the book of Imam al Bukhari, that of Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisa'i. And Muwatta Malik. And they didn't consider Ibn Majah's book to be of the Qutb Sitta. But other scholars refuted this and rejected this by saying Imam Malik's book was a great book. It was an authentic book, but it didn't have that many ahadith in it. Com especially compared to Ibn Majah. Secondly, Malik's book, Rahimullah, was not authored during the what? Wasn't authored during the Golden Era. Imam Malik died 179. He died before the second century was even over. Thirdly, Imam Malik's book has many ahadith that don't have chains of narration. Fourthly, Imam Malik's book is heavily, heavily mired in the athar, the tabi'een statements, and some of the companions' rules and judgments, let alone the opinions of Malik, let alone the opinions of Abu Hanifa sometime and other versions of his, of his muatta. So some people say that therefore these things all render Imam Malik's book unacceptable to be put among the quote-unquote six mother books of hadith. Other scholars said that the sixth book was the book of a dadimi rahimahullah, Abdurrahman ibn Abdullah, Salman al Qandi, a dadimi, who died in the third century, who's from the most uh, uh, able teachers of Imam al Tirmidhi also. Okay? Uh, and some scholars say that no, Ibn Majah's book is the sixth book, even though it has many hadith which are not authentic and genuine, 
But they say Kathra to Zawai. They had so many narrations that weren't found in the other six, other five books. Let alone, they say, the beautiful way in which he organized and arranged his chapters and chapter headings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Khairan, inshallah. So therefore, these are called these six books of hadith. Alright? So what we want to talk about briefly, we said briefly, is the... Uh, ways in which these imams wrote these books, why, how, and what's so special about them. As for the specific life biographies of them, then within Azawajal, they will be done in separate lecture series like that of Al Bukhari and of Imam Muslim. Khairan, inshallah. Uh, we'll speak about a few books here. Firstly, is the book of Abu Dawood, rahimahullah. From the most distinguishing features, and, and also we're going to make a separate lecture series. Some of them, alhamdulillah, are already there. But we're going to publish them and make more in which we talk about Abu Dawood's book in detail. But this is just bakhtisar, in summary, in brief. Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, from the most distinguishing features of his book, is that most of the ahadith of ahkam are in his book, or a large number of them. A large number of the hadith that talk about the halal and the haram and what to do in fiqh. So Abu Dawood's book is considered to be a major resource for a faqih, for a fiqh doctor. A major resource. It's a book in which the faqih can open up from cover to cover and benefit from and take from and find the, the hadith, whether it's authentic or not. Whether it's extremely weak or a little weak or not, but it's the place in which he can take what he wants to use as a legal proof. And does a weak hadith, or can a weak hadith be used as a legal proof? That's a different topic of discussion. Very important, but a different topic of discussion. So that's the main distinguishing mark of Abu Dawood Rahimullah's book. Is that it is a book that heavily deals with the books or the hadith of what? Of fiqh. Of fiqh. Number two. Uh, Abu Dawood Rahimullah did not declare every hadith in his book to be sound. He didn't say that. He didn't claim that. Rather, he mentioned, he says, I mentioned in my book that which is authentic, that which is close to the high level of authentic, and he says, uh, that which is similar to, and he says, and that which has extreme weakness in it, I clearly spoke about. In other words, Abu Dawood criticized hadith in his book. He mentions a hadith, and he himself will say that it's not authentic. But it's what's been mentioned, and it's what some scholars use as a proof, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And he says, and anything that was extremely weak, I spoke about. But anything that I kept quiet on, then it is salih. It's salih. It's usable. And there's difference of opinion on exact, or the exact intended meaning of the word salih. Was it, is hasan li datihi, it, is, it itself is hasan, or is hasan li ghayrihi, it needs a further strengthening report to be made hasan. Khayr, inshallah, moving on, because we don't want to get into details with some of those terms, because they're very technical and critical. And they'll be covered in in later classes. Um, another distinguishing feature of his book is that Imam Abu Dawood, he has several other chapters that aren't pertaining to fiqh. He has chapters on adab, behavior, Islamic behavior, Islamic etiquettes and morals, values. Very beneficial chapter. He has a book that talks about al-sunnah, yani the creed. He has a chapter that speaks about the creed, in which he talks about the correct creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah al Hadith, with regards to the Quran being the speech of Allah, with regards to the companions, with regards to Iman fluctuating, with regards to the Qadr, the predestiny of Allah Azza wa Jal and fate, and all of these different things in which the different uh, groups of the people of innovation reared their ugly heads and opposed the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to creed. Dogmatic issues, dogmatic things of dogma, okay? Of aqeed, of tawheed, of iman. Uh, and there are other books in which Abu Dawood um, brought that speak about issues that are not necessarily uh, regarding fiqh, quote unquote. Khairan, inshallah. There are a few explanations of the book of uh, Abu Dawood. Uh, the books of Sunan are not like the book of Al Bukhari and Muslim, they have so many different explanations for obvious reasons. The book of Bukhari Muslim were superior. Okay, in general, even though there's some superiorities of the books of Sunan of the Sahis, especially the book of Abu Dawood. Okay, from those books was a book by one of the great scholars of India, 
um, who died <coughs> not too long ago, uh, towards the end of the uh, 14th century of the Hijra, which is called Aun al Ma'bud by Al Azim Abadi. Azim Abadi. Shams Azim al Abadi. He wrote a book called Aun al Ma'bud, which is considered to be uh, a summarized explanation, a summarized commentary. There are many other books uh, that have been put into existence in explaining Abu Dawood that came before him. Okay? Uh, many people explain the book of Abu Dawood, but not many of those explanations survived to this day. Well, many of them, only their pieces felt. So on and so forth. Khair, inshallah. Moving on. The next book is the book of At-Tirmidhi. And uh, before we move on, sorry, Abu Dawood, he actually called his book Sunan. Sunan. Khair. At-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, he wrote his book, and some scholars say it's called al Jami al sahih Others say it's called al Jami, And others say that it's called as sunan But in general, a tirmidhis book is considered to be among the four Sunan. Now in the book of a tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, some scholars have quoted that it is the most beneficial book from the six books of Hadith. I quote, they say that the book of Tirmidhi, they didn't say it's the most authentic, they didn't say it's the most popular, they didn't say it was the easiest, but they said it's the most beneficial book of all six books of Hadith. And that's going to become clear in the following points. First and foremost, at Tirmidhi, like Abu Dawood, he organized his book, Al Al Qutub, the books, then the sub chapter headings. Then at Tirmidhi, from the distinguishing features of his books, of his book, is that he makes a ruling on all of the hadith. After the end of the hadith, he says what level of authenticity the hadith has. Hadha hadithun hasanun sahih. Hadha hadithun hasanun sahihun gharib. Hadha hadithun gharib. Laysa isnaaduhu bin qaim. Laysa isnaaduhu bin muttasil. Fihi kathiru attirab. Wa la yasihu fihi shay'an rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa la yasihu fihi kabiru shay'an rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So on and so on and so on and so forth. I tell him that he makes a ruling on the hadith. And this is from the most special benefits that you'll get from the six books of hadith. Many hadith, Abu Dawood doesn't talk about. Nasai doesn't talk about. Ibn Majid doesn't talk about. Bukhari Muslim. I tell him that every hadith, he gives you a ruling. So therefore, anyone can benefit from his book. A hadith specialist, a hadith master, a hadith pupil, someone in the middle, at the top, at the bottom, in the beginning. Everybody can get some benefit and they can say... I don't know too much about it, but I know a Tirmidhi, who was a dependent upon Imam, a student of Bukhari, he said the hadith is authentic, that's sufficient for me. As a blind follower, or a layman, or beginner student, my feet are not wet, my, my, my hands are not strong enough yet to break the board. I can't break the board myself, but my master did. You see? And this is a very important benefit of that book. Because a beginner is sufficient for him to follow and mimic the actions of his teacher, of someone who is attested to as being an expert and a specialist in the field. So this is why, this is one of the reasons why I tell me this book is the most beneficial book of the six books of Hadith, without a doubt. Number two, I tell me the Rahim of Allah Ta'ala, he was from the pioneers of one of the subgenres of the science of Hadith, which is called a takhrij ilm takhrij referencing the Hadith. At the end of, or after he quotes the hadith with his chain of narration, he says, Abu kada kada kada, chapter, this is mentioned from the Prophet, for example, Salah. Then he mentions his sub chapter, and he quotes one with his Isnad, reported to me, Fulan, from Fulan, from Fulan, who heard from Anas ibn Malik that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said kada kada. He makes a hukum on a hadith, sometimes before, sometimes after, and then he says, Wafil bab. He says, also regarding this topic, it's been a hadith reported by Ibn Umar, and Usama Ibn Zaid, and Aisha, and Ibn Mas'ud, and Abu Dhar, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. So at Tirmidhi, in other words, he's telling you that there are other companions who reported this hadith, and that is a benefit with regards to the science of hadith, a hadith being gharib or not, and also supporting narrations, and it is a means of you continuing your study. Because now you want to know where are all these other hadith by these companions collected. In the Musnad works, the Sahih works, the Muwatta works, the Musannaf works. 
And that started the whole culture of a takhrij which we cannot explain in detail right now in this lesson. So, bidnillah, azza wa jalla, we will suffice ourselves with this. We ask Allah, azza wa jalla, to give us true understanding of the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Allah, azza wa jalla, knows best.